ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له وان محمدا عبده ورسوله ان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us all with a straight path, not the wrong, crooked, uh, misguided sirat, uh, insha'Allah ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 17 times when we do salah, ahdina sirat al-mustaqim. And that's what we always ask. Show us the right path and help us, Ya Rabbal Alameen, to follow. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Um, that said, insha'Allah, we come straight to the biography of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And today we're going to talk how now Islam is going to be physically, physically Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam become a prophet. So just because last week we talked about that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he got the angel uh, of Jibreel, right? And Jibreel alayhi wa sallam uh, told him in the cave, Iqra, does not mean he became a prophet yet. So I thought prophethood start right from there. From there, he did not know what was going on, right? When he come home and he was scared, which is natural. Uh, he's a brave man in reality, but it's very natural to be scared when something like this happened to you. And he ran straight to his wife and that showed you the good relationship between husband and wife. Then the wife calmed him down based on his quality and behaviors and social justice and how he helped people in town. Then she took him immediately after he calmed down to her cousin, Waraka bin Nofal, who, who he told him, you're gonna be a prophet and not only that, he, you're going to be kicked out from your town. So now, this week, we're going to talk about how he became officially prophet. Because from that time till Jibreel alayhi salam stopped visiting him, the only time he came appealed to him in a week uh, outside of Mecca. A little bit outside of Mecca, Jibreel alayhi salam come and he see him in his real, real state. Uh, the 600 wing in each side, uh, fooling the horizon each uh, each direction. And all you see Jibreel alayhi salam as if he's sitting on a chair. And then Jibreel alayhi salam come down on the earth as a as an angel. And he hit with his angel an empty sandy land, no water. But when he hit with his uh, wing as if he digged a hole and then the water starts coming out. Then Jibreel alayhi salam, he became like a man and he made ablution. So he's teaching Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam physically how to make wudu. He didn't tell him, bring water with you and come meet me outside. SubhanAllah. Jibreel alayhi salam was a miracle. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the ability. So he dig the ground with his wind. The water comes out and he made wudu. And he was asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to do the same. So he made the wudu. Then Jibreel alayhi salam did two rak'ah salah. And Muhammad watched him, and after that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he will pray two rukah. And then he told them, this is prescribed on you now. At least two rukah a day and two rukah at night. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, immediately when he comes home, and then Jibreel come down on him in the house of Khadija, and he give him the ayat of Surah Al-Muddathir. So if you want to look at Surah Al-Muddathir, one of the Surah in Juz'at 28, right? And Surah Al-Muddathir number 74. Uh, Al-Muddathir mean it's someone wrapped or enveloped with a garment. He wrapped himself with a gar with blankie, garment, whatever it is, with his clothes, covering himself and everything. So he stayed home for a few days. It's almost two weeks now. And he's expecting after he saw Jibreel alayhi salam and he taught him how to, how to make wudu, how to do salah. Now what's next? Now I know how to make wudu and I know how to do salah. What's next? Yani subhanallah, it's not like was required from him for every time Jibreel alayhi salam will come with a revelation on him. Oh yeah, come meet me on the mountain of cave. Mountain of cave was not a place always, always for Jibreel alayhi salam to engage with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It's happened once and never after that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam had to, pull, to go and climb the mountain. Climbing that mountain, sitting there and rehab and, and uh, act this 
this being uh, alone and thinking was ended from that day as if يعني, he was looking for something and that something came to him now but he doesn't really exactly know what, what's next how he's going to be prepared now what's next his you know his wife's cousin told him you're going to be a prophet and a messenger and ذلك الناموس and that's Jibreel the angel Jibreel visited all the previous prophets and messengers before you but let me tell you he said if I live enough and I have a strength I will support you I will follow you I will believe in you but he was old already and he told him your own people will force you out of your town which is Mecca but Rasulullah was very much surprised. Then when he was home that day, Jibreel alayhi salam come into the house and he give him this, the beginning of the surah, surah al-Muddathir, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ya ayyuha al-Muddathir, qum fa'anthir, wa rabbaka fa'kabbir, wa thiyabaka fa'tahir, wa rujza fa'hjur, up to here. What does that mean, Ya Ayu al Oh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, the one who's inv uh, uh, enveloped himself with the garments, that's al Muddathir. Qum fa'andir, arise and warn. Get up. Qum is when somebody gives you a command, Qum means you have to stand up. And what are you going to do? And there, warn the people. Wa rabbaka fakabbir. And your Lord has to be magnified. So what does that mean? You have to tell the people and tell yourself, there's nothing big in your life anymore. Neither your status, your position, your money, your wife, your children. I mean, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has a beautiful family. He has a beautiful wife. He has a nice children, successful money, everything he position, respect. I mean, people call him Al-Ameen. He had no problem, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from the time he married and uh, 15 years now in his life, very comfortable zone. Right now, it says no more comfortable, no more sleeping nice, no more engaging with your wife and the family only. Now you have a job. Now everything else is down. And Allah Akbar, Rabbaka Fakabir, glory. Uh, uh, your Lord is a magnified. So your Lord is bigger than anything you can imagine. The family, the tribes, uh, uh, the leaders in Mecca, because uh, there's many big people. Leaders in Mecca, they consider themselves they're the one who carries the city of Mecca. And city of Mecca is like uh, the center of the world back then in Arabia. Uh, it wasn't just like, uh, okay, Mecca is desert. Someone might say that. No, but Mecca and the leader of Mecca were really important figure in the Arabian. Uh, people will come from east, west, north, south, all the way uh, annually. And more than that, they will come do Hajj, do Umrah. The Hajj and Umrah never ended, never stopped from the time of Ibrahim salam. They know the value of that house. So those Arab, they were believing in the Rabbul Kaaba. They believe in the Lord of the Kaaba and Rabbu Ibrahim and Deen Ibrahim. This is all they had, the religion of Ibrahim. But, but 500 years before, it was messed up a little bit because this guy named Amru, you remember? He was a leader and he was a rich man. Uh, he traveled to North uh, Arabia and he came to the border of Bilal Sham. He found these Arab people adopting idolatry worshippers and they have images and they call them goddess. He loved the idea. Uh, Shaitan played big role with them and he came home on the camel, huge, made of stone to uh, Allati wal Uzza. He brought them. And he introduced it to the Arab, and the Arab, they said, you are a wise man, you are our leader, whatever you say, hi, we are with you. You see how friendship is dangerous? You look up to someone, if they misguide you, easy. If you're, if those are your models, they're going to misguide you, God forbid. You know, Amru misguided Arabia for 500 years after him, generation after generation. Now, not only uh, two idols they have, they have more than 360 idols. Every tribe who's coming from different uh, cities and different area, uh, they will make them idols behalf their name. This way, when they come to Mecca, they don't have to bring their own goddess with them. You know, I don't know if there is some polytheist, you know, the, the one who worship idols, maybe they carry stuff with them. Uh, I believe, uh, I'm going to say, يعني, some Christianity, uh, when they carry that cross, they feel with that cross, they are protected, and they touch the cross if they're praying. Uh, we don't have such like this uh, in, in Islam, right? 
uh, subhanallah, you carry the Quran in your mind and your heart. If you carry it for the purpose to read, not to purpose to pro the the book itself is not going to protect you, right? Uh, so forget what we say chit chatting before about people in Damascus. Just having a book on your shelf is not going to protect you or bless you. But if you read it, if you're connected with these books, that's the protection come. That's uh, from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Uh, so now he has to tell, he has to let the people know that Allah Akbar in Kulli Shay. That's why the Muslim, the first word, what do we say? Allahu Akbar. Anything happens, something big happened, we say Allahu Akbar. Something bad happened, we say Allahu Akbar. Accident happened, we say Allahu Akbar. Uh, very big successful news, somebody's getting money, somebody's, uh, uh, you know, college students achieving the words, we say Allahu Akbar. Takbir, Allahu Akbar. You see all these people shouting. Uh, God is greatest, God is greatest, right? Because we really put Allah, we should, not by word only, we should put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above everything. Yeah, we are happy with whatever, uh, you know, event happening, but Allah is greater than that. Allah, you know, being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and praising Allah is Allah is above. That's what really, وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ Then it says, وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَهَرْ Which is, your garments uh, purify. All these verses are short, but it's command, 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 amr. You, uh, you know, Allah is telling him what to do, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Later on, of course, this command is for us as a believer and follower. With uh, Yabaka someone might say, why? The clothes of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was filthy? Not necessarily. But the purification here, uh, it's a little bit different. It's not only the out garment also, but the inner, the inner uh, the organs. Your heart, his heart was already purified, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at the age of what? Uh, four, right? Uh, with the first inshirah, uh, 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 the first operation he had uh, by the angel when he was by living by uh, Halima Saadiyah's house, right? So uh, already his heart was purified. But now we need to purify ourselves, our inner, because there's nothing in, in you should be uh, astraying you from being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No pollution, no bad idea, no envy, no magician, no magic, no um, uh, culture. Nothing should make you connected strongly more than the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything we have to believe it, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing, there's nothing Astana can do for me. Even if she say, I'm gonna help you. There's nothing she can do for me except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the help comes to you with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah allows somebody's heart to be soft and gentle to you to come and support you if you have a crisis. And that, that's how we believe, that's how we take it. We say thank you to each other, but does not mean really without you I was dying, right? You saved my life. This word should not come from the Muslim mouth. Nobody saved our lives. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who saved our life. And alhamdulillah that Allah sent people in our path, right? And those people's hearts sometimes become so gentle, so soft, and they become the one who can help us and, uh, you know, remove a little bit from the calamity we're in, subhanAllah. So this is what thiyabaka fatahar means. It's inner and outside, purifying. fahjur, Which is keep away from rujz, which is the idolatry. Idolat worshippers. Uh, I'm gonna turn the heat a little bit. It's so hot. So hot. Uh, so uh, this on the command, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam receive it, and immediately he knew it. This is the time now for the da'wah. This is it. Come for and there. There's nothing more than that you can say. Get up and uh, preach, warn, and then you have to elevate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above everything. You have to be pure inside and outside and no idolic worshippers. What does that mean? Pure your foundation of your greed, creed, aqidah, your creed. You're believing, no idols. That means your hope is not connected with any of those idols around you. Your hope has to be directly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now, I mean, think about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hey, how is gonna just go out and tell the people? And uh, everywhere, every house full of idols. 
Mecca is a Kaaba is inside and outside full of idols. This is something 500 years being going on. Now he's going to go and tell them, hey, la ilaha illallah, I am your messenger, right? Isn't it hard? Isn't it tough? Yes, it is. But look what he did. Right after that, there is one ayah came also from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنْذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Start with your immediate family. So now you have two weeks, three weeks, young Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after the angel came to you, now you are being planned. How am I going to do this? What should I do this? Now this is the time now you're going to get up and do it. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, start with your immediate family. So the first step before he do the immediate family, right after Jibreel alayhi salam, show him how to do wudu, how to do two ruk'ah, the appropriate way. He comes home and he teaches his wife. So Khadija radiallahu anha is the first one who accepted Islam in, human, in all men and women in Arabia. She is the first individual human being. So she got up, she learned how to make wudu, she learned how to do salat with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Then all the girls, he has four girls. The four girls learned and they accepted their father as a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Ali radiallahu an was 10 years old that time. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa brought him from the house of Abi Talib, his uncle, who now he's repaying a favor to his uncle. Remember, his uncle adopted him after the grandfather died, and he was like the age of 12. So uh, Abi Talib, uh, you know, he's getting a old, and he has so many children. And when he get married, and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi has a family, he went to Abu Talib, he said, I really want to help you. Give me one of your son, uh, and let him, you know, uh, I will help you raising him. Let him. Uh, this way, I'll take one person away from so many children and, you know, family you need to feed. So he gave him Ali to stay in Muhammad's house. I mean, the house from here to here. It's not like, uh, you know, from Palestine to America or from Venezuela to America. So you take somebody else's kid, it will be like a uh, far distance. It's, it's in the same town, walking distance. So um, I, Abi Talib was very happy. So he gave him Ali and Ali lived in his house for a few uh, couple of years already. And then at the age of 10, when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became a prophet. So from the young kids, Ali radiallahu an, he was the first one to accept Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a messenger. Officially, he told him, he, did, he shook his hand. He said, Ubayuak, I believe you are the man, you are the prophet, you are the messenger, and whatever you give, I am with you. So right after that now, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he invited uh, all his immediate family. And it counted in the seerah, it says around 45 people. Remember, these are big families. So 45 people gathered and he gave them walima, you know, like a huge dinner. And after the dinner, he got up and he told them, you are my immediate family. You know who I am. You know who's my family. But I have to tell you now that if you guys don't follow me, if you guys don't believe in the words I'm going to give it, I'm going to convey it to you, you're all going to get in trouble and you're going to be in hellfire. Why? Oh, uh, Prophet uh, uh, Jibreel alayhi salam came on me and I was assigned to be a prophet. I did not ask for it. I didn't, I'm not the one who, uh, you know, attended classes of philosophy and went to school. Then suddenly I graduated. I come here with great knowledge. Now I'm the philosopher in the country. You're going to listen to me now? No, this is it. This is it. You just have to, be, to listen because I am the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody who's sitting, men, women, children, everybody was like so quiet as if birds can land on the top of their head. Immediately, who got up? His own uncle, Abi Lahab. He got up and he said, you, among all these 45 people, you see them. Some people look better than you. Some people have a, a position stronger than you. Some people have a money more than you. Some people have wisdom more than you. You think God is going to choose you above us? Now, Allah, we're not going to listen to you. I am not going to listen to you. 
I'm not going to follow you. You're my nephew. That's all. That's all. And he looked around. He said, let me know if anybody wants to follow this. This is crazy. And nobody said anything. But nobody got up and give the bay'ah and said, you know what? You don't want to follow Abu Lahab? I want to follow Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nobody. Except now again, Ali, in front of his family, in front of the older and the younger and the men and the women, he got up, he said, Ana ala dini Muhammad. I am following the deen of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he, in front of everybody, he announced that he will obey and follow Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, believe in him. So the family is gone. Everybody is gone. But here, Yani, a first human being who allow to dehumanize Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in front of everybody to make him so small to be little him, he had a he had a great courage. But Allah subhanahu wa taala, look, he continued this pattern even though he's a on the his immediate fa remember his uncle, his yani, his father father's brother. Uh, so called Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never met his father. So this man, as if he's what? Like his dad. Yani he could call Abi Talib my father. He never met his father. All his uncles is like taking the position of the father, right? Even though, even though, even though the two daughters of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Zainab and Ruqayya, were already engaged with Kitab Kitab with uh, Utba and Utayba, the two sons of their uh, uncle. Uh, so the immediate cousin uh, didn't care. So Abi Lahab got up. He said, "We don't want to hear from you. We don't want to listen to you. This is nonsense." He picked up himself and he left. So then everybody left. Nobody said anything except Ali radiallahu anhu. So now Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, <clears throat> "This is the only way I'm going to do this that one now. I'm going to start by secret. I'm going to do it in secret way." So he started talking to his friend. <laughs> the first one he talked to his friend, of course, you all know Islam. Abi Bakr. Oh, yeah, I forgot to say that. He had a like adopted son called Zaid ibn Harith al Kalbi, right? Uh, Zaid was a, a slave man, young man. To uh, He has a beautiful story uh, to Khadija, radiallahu anha. But when Khadija married Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she said, Zaid is your uh, uh, ghulam, he will be yours. Uh, your servant, so you just whatever help you need, Zaid there to help you, right? And later on, Zaid, uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved him so much, uh, he used to call him as a son. Uh, Zaid also, he uh, announced his shahada and he said, uh, I am on your religion, I believe in you, whatever you say, I believe in you. So now we have um, Khadija, radiallahu anha, the four girls, Zainab, Ruqayya, Abu Kalthum, and Fatima. Fatima, yani, you won't consider she was very young. She was three, four years old. Uh, then you have uh, Ali, radiallahu an, 10 years old. Now we have Zaid bin Haritha, which is, uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he, he freed him, but he's still a servant. Yani, you're going to say he's a servant, right? So who, who accepted Islam now? A woman, uh, four girls, which is his family, and young boy, Ali, radiallahu anhu, and a servant. Now, Islam, what? Abi Bakr. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has a good friend. From, you know, he had a lot of friends in the city of Mecca before the Bi'tha, as we said, we mentioned, everybody respected his opinion. But uh, specifically, he was a very good friend with Abi Bakr al-Siddiq. I want to tell you, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was two years younger than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So think, so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the age of 40 now, he became a prophet. Abi Bakr was 38 years old. So he went to him directly, immediately. When he went to him, he did not hesitate. He did not say, let me think about it. He did not say, I'll get back to you, just like his immediate family. Yes, Abi Lahab said, no, I'm not going to listen. But the rest of the family, nobody said anything. Uh, probably they needed time to think. Nobody said, any, nobody said, oh yeah, I want, yeah, khalas, I believe in you. You know, we love you, we respect you, whatever you say. Nobody said that. But who did? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq immediately, immediately said, if that's what you're saying, he shook his hand and he said, Ana ala I am with you, I am right there, I will put if anything will take from me under your servant, Ya Rasulullah. 
But who is Abu Bakr? You have to consider Abu Bakr is the jewel of Mecca, not only Mecca, the Arabian. Abu Bakr radiallahu an, it's his family are the one who's responsible to pay the debt of the Arabian when someone get in trouble and they borrow money and then the time come to pay back their debt and then they can't pay back and then they catch the man to beat him up or to kill him or to torture him or to prison him, Abi Bakr al-Siddiq will come and he will pay their debt without any waiting to pay him back. Him and his tribe, that was their job in Mecca. Look how generous they were. Look how generous. And that's the key of the successful of a, a, a merchant uh, man, businessman. Abu Bakr Siddiq was a businessman. But this business, what he's doing, such a good act, it's not in the name of Allah. It was not Islam, but it shows you the quality of Abu Bakr Siddiq and his family, right? So beside that, it says, he, everyone respected Abu Bakr. Because he's very successful, honest, never bowed down to idols, never had alcohol in his life. Everybody adore and admire the position of Abu Bakr in this society. Because he has such a knowledge, Arabia, uh, Arabian used to uh, fight over uh, their lineage. So Alm uh, and Sab, the knowledge or the science of genealogy, he, no man, no man have the science of genealogy like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And that's why traveling with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, traveling with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and conveying the message, when they go to sit and try before they enter the tent or before they meet the leaders, Abu Bakr will tell Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam everything about this tribe from his head. He has that knowledge. Then he has the knowledge of society. Then he had the science of society. Then he had the language, linguistic. Then he has among, uh, among the Arabia, he had the first merchant almost in Mecca. There's many other merchandise in Mecca, uh, men working in, in commerce, but Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was outstanding. His business was outstanding. His literacy, uh, science and social knowledge, it was to the extreme as if he graduated from College with so many degrees. That's Abi Bakr. But the minute Abi Bakr al-Siddiq accepted this, the hadith, it says, Rasulullah sallallahu when he conveyed the message, everyone, it says the hadith, I'm going to say it in Arabic, uh, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم, ما دعوت الإسلام إلا كانت عنده كبوة وتردد ونظر إلا أبي بكر ما عكم حين دعوته ولا تردد فيه. Means that Rasulullah Sallallahu said, everyone I convey the message to them, they will hesitate, they will say I need time, they will look, they will think, they will come back to, you, to him. They accept the Islam later, but they take time. Except he said, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq didn't even think twice. So that's why, uh, I mean, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Siddiq, uh, he, he, Siddiq means it's his nickname. He, he got it from, Rasulullah called him the Siddiq because he will believe immediately with the truth. And Abu Bakr, one of his quality was he always searched for the truth. He didn't want to believe in hypocrisy. He hated lying. Truth was his hadaf, goal, always. So that's why uh, Rasulullah sallallahu named him the one who believe in the truth, al-Siddiq, yasduq. So now the minute Abu Bakr al-Siddiq became Muslim, he did the shahada, what he does? You think he just go home and say, okay, let me see what's next. What's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa gonna ask me? What should I do? He didn't even think. He didn't wait, he didn't wait for any direction from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't wait for any ayat to come down. He didn't wait for any preparation. He didn't scare. Immediately he go and reach out all his good friends. You know, each one of us, we are friends. We become Muslim, we should go straight to our friends and we tell them, hey, this is good stuff, come do it. So he goes number one to Uthman bin Affan. Allahu Akbar. Uthman bin Affan, it's another, like, like these are the giant men in Islam and in Mecca before Islam and after Islam, of course. Abu Bakr is the Khalifa al Ula and Uthman is the Khalifa Talitha the third uh, caliph of Muhammad and Uthman bin Affan, he was at that age, 34 years old, young man, businessman, 
traveler, smart. Those are the top of the successful people, Rajal A'mal, businessmen. So when he go invite Uthman bin Affan to the religion, he said, Khalas, you believe in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a messenger? I am with you. I accept it. He accept. Now imagine every good deed Uthman does, who received the amount, the amount of the good deeds? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Of course, go, all goes to the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But imagine. Because we know how generosity, how generous was Uthman bin Affan, how his life was amazing life he did. Then after that, Abdul Rahman bin Auf. Abdul Rahman bin Auf, one of those leaders also in Mecca. And what is he? He's 33, he's 30 years old, young man, accepted Islam. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, my God, these all became emirs for Egypt, emirs for uh, this city and that city immediately in the time of Abdul, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab. And the minute he ran to Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, and he was 17 years old, 17 years old. So Abi Bakr al-Siddiq did not care if they're businessmen, let me go to the successful businessman, let me see who I'm going to... Anyone he think this is a man suitable for this religion, he run to them and he will tell them. So Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, he, be, he was 17 years old. He accepted Islam. As Zubair ibn al-Awwam, Zubair ibn al-Awwam is like a first cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi from his, his mom, Safiya. Uh, Safiya is the auntie of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi His father's sister. As Zubair ibn al-Awwam, he was what? 12 years old, young boy. Accepted Islam. Talha bin Ubaidullah. Wakana, he was 13 years old. These are men, whether they're too young or, uh, I mean, the age of 30 plus, it's wonderful, right? Immediately, if Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said so, they all trusted Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and they came to Islam. Those are five champions of Islam. And those are, they established based on the information they got it directly. They didn't even meet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They didn't say, hold on, hold on. I'm going to go see Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam myself. But later on, when they accept Islam, they come to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq al and he will, uh, you know, they would shake Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is all now happening in secret. No matter how. Now imagine each one of them now, they're going to go to their family, to their friend, and Islam spreading. Uh, slowly, slowly, Islam is spreading. So now, uh, once upon a time, this is in Jahiliya time, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he took a trip, business trip. And uh, when they take business trip, usually they don't go alone, right? They have caravan. They have uh, many, many uh, uh, businessmen together. Yeah, this group of animal are yours, but these are mine. Uh, but they go together, they travel together. Among those people, Umayya bin Khalaf sent his caravans, and the caravans was led by Bilal. We all know who's Bilal, right? Bilal al-Habashi, uh, the slave man by Umayya. So when Bilal was traveling with Abu Bakr, they became very good friends because Abu Bakr was a humble man. He was beloved by everyone. He did not say, you know what? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm a friend with Osman bin Affan and a friend with all these giant people, the Arab. But Bilal, come on, Bilal is a slave man. How he made friendship with Bilal. But that show you also his humbleness. He's really, in, he's full of a human. He loved humanity. So he became so close friend with Bilal. So when they finished and they came back, and was now Abu Bakr Sadiq became Muslim, what did he do? He meet Bilal somewhere in secret and he invite him to Islam. And of course, because Bilal trusted Abu Bakr and loved him, he said, me too, خلاص, I accepted. I accepted Islam. And now from Islam, from Bilal, the slave man, he has to meet the other slave men, right? They know each other. He will go to Khabab and he tell him, oh man, you're gonna come to Islam. And this is this, but Khabab in the beginning, he said, how are we gonna, well, we are a slave. We don't have our own freedom. How are we gonna believe, believe in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a messenger where our master are idol, idol, idolic worshippers? We can't do that. But Bilal courage him. he said, your, your mind is free. Your heart don't belong to your master. Your muscle belong to your master. Uh, be a good slave, nothing wrong with that. You have to fulfill your duties. 
But how we think at the end of the day, what God, you, what kind of God, what God you call on at night when you're in, you're in trouble, when you're happy, is that's you're free. So yes, you are slave, even if you have a chains on your hand, on your legs, on your arm, right? But you are free to call on Allah. So Khabbab became Muslim. Then it went to Yasser family, Ammar and his wife Sumayya. Back then, Sumayya was an old woman. She was 65 years old already, and her husband near 70. They had this one son, mid-20s, Yasser. Yasser, radiallahu anhu, he's the one who brought Islam to the house. You know, when he accepted Islam, he was scared to tell his parents because, you know, they, they're poor. Uh, she was working as a maid in, in uh, those, you know, Arab leaders' house. The father was just, you know, have very... Uh, humble, uh, serving uh, other people's, making their income. So he was so scared till uh, an idolic uh, uh, image fell off the shelf and it broke in the house. And Sumaya jumped and she said, oh God, uh, oh, oh my son Yasser, you broke the God we worship. What's gonna happen with us now? She was so terrified, like something bad gonna happen. The kill is gonna come on her and her family. Then Yasser, he said, pick up your head, pick up your head. Look, this is not gonna bring us curse. This is just a storm. Whatever is it broke. He didn't help himself. If he was really God, he, he, he will prevent himself from broking. Mom, you have to come and you have to believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is gonna save us from the hellfire. And Yasser teach his parents to be a Muslim and they become Muslim. And then when they are working in this, the master of Mecca's houses, they find out that Sumayya accepted Islam. And we know in the history in Mecca, the, the first woman who'd been tortured and just like Bilal and even more was Sumayya. Her master was so upset when he find out that the slave woman who come to the house and clean the house and cook and take care in the house at the end of the day, go home with just a piece of bread to feed her husband and her son. Now she is going to rebel. She's going to follow Muhammad where he considered himself he's not going to follow. So he was very upset and he will take her to the desert. He will make the children come and spit on her and throw her with a stone and tie her hand, tie her legs. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he saw the family of Yasser being tortured. He saw Khabbab being tortured. He saw Bilal radiallahu anhu being tortured. And this is right after Islam start now spreading a little bit by it's not, no more secret. We are in the age of three, the third year or the fourth year, the fourth year, okay? Islam start becoming loud immediately right the acceptance of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And his story, it goes like this. Umar ibn al-Khattab disagreed with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, never met him, never listened to the ayat from him. But خلاص, the leader of Quraysh don't want to hear from Muhammad from the two time he invites you know, invite him and he tells him to come to listen to me, didn't want to. And the third time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told him, now you have to convey loudly, right? So he has to go out. He went to the mountain of Safa and he called all the people of, of uh, Quraysh, uh, not uh, Quraysh, only Mecca. All, every tribe in Mecca has to come because uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has to say something. And that was, a, that was a culture by them. That was a culture. If somebody's going to announce something, whether they go in that clubhouse, the leader will hear it, or someone will come on the mountain and they will call, come on, somebody's going to say something and everybody will come. Or around the Kaaba. But Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't come around the Kaaba, he went to the mountain of Safa and he called. And if people did not hear, he will ask them, just if, if the leader of that certain tribe, certain family is not home, let them send some, let them send somebody just to hear what I'm gonna say. So all people gathered and a lot of people did not know yet Muhammad is a messenger, right? Because it was going on in secret. A lot of people will come, a lot of people come, everybody came and he told them, uh, you know who I am, right? I am Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. They said, yeah, we know you. You know who is my wife and my family? Yeah, we know you. You know, I am the trustworthy. I am Al-Amin, Amin Wazi al ummah This is the trustworthy of this, you know, city. They said, yeah, we love you. We listen to you. You're, you are a sadiq. He told them, did you ever catch me lying? Everybody said, no. Everybody's like approving that, okay. You're the one who says the truth, you're uh, the trustworthy, you're this, you're that, we love you. What's behind, what, what, what's next? He told them, 
if I tell you that behind this mountain, you don't see it, but I look the other direction and I see a, a group of horse coming to attack the city of Mecca, would you believe me? Everybody said, ma shahidna alayka kadiban. We never catch you lying. Why not? Why, why we, we're not going to believe you at the age of 40? You're not going to lie. You never lied before. And he told them, okay, bayna yadayya adabun alim. What does that mean? Among my hand, there's a severe punishment. So the Arab understood immediately. You don't listen to me. You don't obey me. You're going to be in trouble. Not only that, you're going to go to hell. What? Hell? Why? People, when they die, they come back. They never believed in judgment day. They didn't believe in judgment day back then. Why? You're, you're telling us something our forefather didn't tell us? What? What? What do you mean? He told them. Qulu. He told them. Qulu. Say, la ilaha illallah. That's how you do the shahada, right? Say, there is no God deserve my deity and worship, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Muhammadun wa ana Rasulullah. I am the servant and the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger. Um, anybody said yes? Nobody said yes. Nobody believed. Again, who opened up the door to be little, the size of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, everybody looking up to Muhammad that minute, Abi uh, Lahab, the uncle, he got up again and he said, Tabban laka, woe to you. Ali hadha jama'atana, you gathered us, you already told us, uh, as a uh, immediate family, you gave us dinner once, twice, you invited us. We told you we're not going to listen to you. Now you're inviting the entire city to tell everyone about this. And he told them, he's my nephew, and my nephew is crazy, absolutely. Don't listen to him. And he ran out. When he ran, everybody turned their face, and they left Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alone. And now, everybody knows that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is calling loudly to this religion. And that's how people start coming more people start coming and when you look at the level of the people most of them are the weak the slave and the poor and the children who they are coming to believe okay now umar ibn al-khattab uh, he heard that one of his servants slave lady in the house was you know slave and servant uh, she accepted islam and he went to her and said what you believe in muhammad she told him why you're eloquent, you're smart. Uh, why you just listen to your friends? Go to Muhammad and listen from him directly. And he stopped beating her up. He took the stick and the whip and he beat her up, he beat her up and he stopped because he gets so weak. When he gets so weak, he tell her, I'm not feeling uh, um, sorry for you because you're crying and beating you up because I'm tired, I need a break. And he will leave her. And then she will say, look, all the beating you're doing to me, Allah made it easy for me. Look how strong you are, because Umar bin Khattab was a huge man in size and yeah, power. And move, huh? Right? <laughs> so he said, and uh, the, the poor woman, after he beat her up, she will say, look, Allah gave me strength. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me strong. I want you to come to this religion. She invited him to this religion. He will, he, will go, he will say, you're crazy, and he will leave. But uh, Umar had that head of wisdom always look into deep things and he will think sometimes he will think about the idol he worship how could this idol you know he was visiting uh, uh immediate family and uh, they had famine they were hungry they didn't have food to eat and they had a goddess made of dates and what did they say okay they look, stare at this the goddess and they said you know what we're hungry, let's eat it. They took the goddess, the image of God made of this. They took it and ate. And then Umar al Khattab was thinking, oh, okay, that's your God and you're eating now? I mean, he always used the logical thinking, right? And then uh, he was in the town and uh, the leader of uh, Quraysh are gathered and everybody saying, uh, Muhammad is, is insane. He's separating our family. Our slave will become uh, uh, rebelling. Uh, they're not obeying us anymore. He's separating husband and wife. He's separating children from their mothers. And, and uh, Suhaib became Muslim. His mom is angry. She swears she's not going to eat ever and brush her hair as long as uh, you don't come back to the religion I was in. And she chained him. And it's a chaos now the whole city of Mecca is chaos what's going on and Umar when he heard all this 
calamity. He didn't care. He did not invite. He was not a, one of the members of the par parliament. He didn't care in the political issue and uh, ideas and stuff like that. So, but when he heard all this problem happening in the city, he went to the leader and said, what's the problem? Why Why it's so much noise here and people are unhappy? They told him, you don't know, Muhammad, in, Muhammad is insane. He's, in, he's calling himself, he's a messenger of God. And uh, we can't stop him. And he said, that's easy. All I have to do, he took his sword out and he said, let me run and go chop his head off. Khalas, we kill him. No more messenger. Uh, and uh, I mean, we're going to bring the city in, in, in the way it was. So he really tried to do the same. And while he's just going, he left the group of people and he was to go and look for where's Muhammad. And a man ran after him, whether he's Sahabi yet, we don't know. And he says, what? You're going to go, go kill Muhammad that simple? Why you don't start with your immediate family? Do you know that your sister Fatima and her husband Saad, both of them accepted Islam and secretly they go to this house and they listen to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they read the Quran. He goes, what? Now what you told me? My family? My sister? My own sister? No way. Okay, let me start with my sister. <laughs> then he comes to the sister's house and behind the door he will hear the verses of Surah Taha. This is just one sentence. It says, Taha means two letters, right? Ta and ha. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ma anzalna alaka al Qur'an li tashqa. We didn't send you the verses of the Qur'an, Ya Muhammad, or O Messenger, to become shaqi. Shaqi means unhappy, unwanted. It's the opposite. This verses of the Qur'an come to you to make you happy, to make you leader, to make you sa'id. It's the opposite. If you're not going to be shaki, what's the opposite? The opposite is to be happy. And he's approaching the house of his sister and he's hearing these verses. He's wondering, I never heard verses. I never heard whatever they call a Quran anyway. Why am I so restless? Why would I kill a man? I didn't even hear what he has to say. Why am I going to kill my sister? I don't even know what she's believing yet, right? So when he attacked and he opened the door, already Khabab in the house, who is bringing the verses from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in secret to the house of Fatima, teaching her husband and Fatima, right? So Khabab ran away in the closet and he closed the door, he scared from Omar. Sad, the husband, he ran away and he hide in the house. And that's your brother who's coming, <laughs> deal with him, right? Her name Fatima. Fatima opened the door, she said, What's behind you? Your eyes is like a fire. What's wrong with you? And he said, what's going on? What's going on? I heard that you are following this man. This man is insane. Everybody complaining about this man. How could you listen to this man? And she said, calm down, calm down. Uh, why you don't uh, listen first? You know, listen to his word. Then judge for yourself because you're smart. You, you're, you speak Arabic. You understand. Nobody has to tell you what Rasulullah is saying. You hear it directly. If you're smart, you hear it directly. You don't listen to the Tyler Taylor. And while he is doing this, the husband come out and he tell him, leave the woman alone. If you want to talk, talk man to man. And then he attack Saad, his name. Then he attack him, they want to fight. And then the sister come in the middle, then he smack his sister face. This is all in the story. Uh, some scholars, they say, not really in detail, but uh, a lot of sira and a lot of scholars and it's written in the books. Uh, whether 100% like this or not, uh, the chaos happening in the house. And then when, uh, you know, he smacked his sister and the sister start, start bleeding. So here now the kinship, the love of the relationship of the kinship comes and he goes, oh, you know, I'm a man. I should not, you know, harm a woman. You know, the Arab, it's a shame to hurt a woman in their culture. So uh, then uh, he said, okay, 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 Fatima, let me see, let me hear those verses I was hearing just before I entered the house. She goes, no, you cannot touch it unless you go and wash yourself and uh, purify yourself and calm down and come talk to, to me. And they say that he did. And uh, a lot of scholars, they based on the story when they say you cannot touch the Quran without wudu. But hey, Back then, it was no wudu. It was not prescribed yet to anybody. It was not, uh, only Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was prescribed for him to pray two ruk'ah, to make wudu. 
uh, yeah, he spread it to his family, but it was not, nobody, nobody's yet doing salah or tahara. Wallahu a'lam, uh, God knows the best. So uh, anyway, so he read, he, because he had uh, that, uh, those ayats written in a piece of paper, when he reads them, he goes, <clears throat> Khabab, take me, where is Muhammad now? They said, Muhammad in a secret house, we cannot take you. He goes, no, 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 I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to listen directly from him. And everybody's come down, they know that, you know, Umar ibn al-Khattab, something's, his heart becomes soft. Uh, Khabab ran away and he said, follow me. But Khabab wants to reach the house of Dar al-Arqam. We used to say this young man named Arqam, he was only 17 years old. His parents not Muslim yet, but he, his house was behind Mountain of Safa. Mountain of Safa now, when you go to Umrah, it's all part of the Haram. But back then, the Haram here, Mountain of Marwa and Safa was really high, consider high back then. And then behind the mountain of Safa, whatever happening at night, nobody will know. People of Quraysh are aware all around the Kaaba back then. So Khabab opened up his house. Imagine, 17 years old. He wants to host Muhammad Sallallahu in his father's house and all the people who come to Islam. There were like 60, 70 of them. And by the year of two and three, they became five, three to 500 people. Allahu Akbar. And they will come at night in secret, group by group, to learn the verses and to make a copy and to take with them. So uh, Khabab ran to the house and he knocks the door and told him, I'm not Khattab coming, but I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared because I'm not Khattab, he caused problems with his systems and everything. Then everybody's so scared. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now he's brave, right? We told you that he's brave. He's braver, braver than any man. He said, don't worry about it. If, if he's here to fight, I am the only one who's going to fight physically. But if he's here to talk, you all can be here. No problem. We will do it. And Rasulullah sallam calmed down everybody. And when Umar ibn al-Khattab arrived, and he came. The minute Umar ibn al-Khattab walked in, and he said, yeah, yeah, Muhammad. Of course, he's not going to say, yeah, Rasulullah. Yeah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he got up, and he used all his muscles to grab Umar ibn al-Khattab from his robe, just like that, and he pulled him, and he shake this a huge man. First of all, he has to show that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to his followers that he's brave. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa right now, he's facing the most terrifying man exists in Mecca. Doesn't matter. That's Umar, doesn't matter. I'll take care of Umar. He's shaking Umar. Number three, he's putting the fear back in Umar's heart. Hey. We're not coward. We're not weak people. Yeah, we're spreading this religion in, an, in a secret way, in a nice way, but when push comes to push, right? We're here to push. With that, holding and shaking him, and he told him, Ila mata ya Umar? How long, ya Umar, your head going to be in the filthy, in the filthy and garbage way? When you're going to pick up your head and come, I'm making dua for you. Allahumma ayyid al-Islam bi Umar. Actually, he made, he made dua bi ahad al-Umarayn. Uh, Amru bin Hisham, which is Abu Jahl leader. Uh, he was also a tough and leader man, right? And very well known in Mecca. I wish he came to Islam back then. Everybody in Mecca will accept Islam. If Abu Jahl and Abu, uh, Abu Lahab accepted Islam back then, everybody will have no uh, prosecution for 13 long years in the city of Mecca. But because of, of those leaders, uh, prevent everybody to, to come Islam easily. But when he said, you're going to listen to those people, come and listen. And he read the verses on him, and he looked at him, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka rasulullah. He accepted Islam right there. And when he accepted Islam, everybody was so happy. It's like now we are so supported by this physically by this man. And he goes, what's going on? Why everybody in secret? Why everybody is hiding? Why everybody is so scared? Including my own sister. Why? 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 Don't you know this religion is the truth? Don't you know, Ya Muhammad, you are on the truth path? He said, yes. He said, so what is all this hidden for? Follow me. Umar ibn al-Khattab got up and he grabbed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa All these hundreds of people around the house come and they march to where? To the Kaaba. And now the da'wah became loudly. No, they were not scared anymore because first of all, when all the uh, uh, immediate family 
uh, came, gathered by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though not one person accepted Islam, except of course Ali radiallahu anhu. But when Abi Lahab, his uncle, got up and he said, we're not, we're not gonna listen to, to you. But Abu Talib said back then, but I, I'm gonna support Muhammad, I'm gonna defend him, I don't have to become Muslim now. But I'm always in a condition of protecting my nephew till I die, because this is the oath I took her and I gave my father, Abdul Muttalib, before he died, he told me, look after your nephew. Yes, my nephew is a man, he's a married, he's a, a father, he's a husband, businessman, doesn't matter, but I am gonna look after him and protect him till I die. This is the oath Abi Talib took. With this oath he had, it, no one physically dare to harm Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for a long time, even though it happened later. Okay, but so far, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if, you know, the Arab, if they say you're under my shadow, خلاص, you're under some big uh, leader's shadow, nobody can hurt you. It's a culture, that's how they lived. <clears throat> so when they all marched around the Kaaba and they announced, uh, they were very happy that Umar ibn Khattab came to Islam. Now, another story to make us happy, uh, a man named Hamza, one of the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa also who, he was in the gathering, but never bothered. He never bothered with a risala, you're a messenger, you're this and that. And he's not, just like Omar, very similar to uh, the personality of Omar. He's not a member in this parliament meeting, and this club they have in Mecca. He always, he loved hunting. He take care of himself, whatever he has, and he always leave Mecca and he go hunt. So while he was hunting and coming back home, in his hand it says rabbits, wild animals, birds, everything, you know, carry him. And coming back on, on his horse to the city, uh, a man approached him. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. A woman actually, this make it a more interesting story. A woman approached him and said, where are you coming from? Hunting? Look, all this animal you hunt, you're showing off and you're carrying the birds, you're carrying the wild rabbits, you're carrying maybe another animals, you're coming back to show us how manly you are. Shame on you. And Hamza was like, what are we talking about? Shame on you, three times. She said, what's going on? He goes, your own nephew being tortured and garbage thrown on his head and they beat him up around the Kaaba and you, if you think you're a man, just go outside the city of Mecca and go after the hunting and come home. You think you're a man? The man who look after their own immediate family. And this woman's telling him this. And he said, my nephew? Who's my nephew? Muhammad, what, why? What, what's happening with Muhammad? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was praying around the Kaaba and uh, the leaders like Umayyah, Abi Sufyan, uh, they called this man and they said, while well, he's praying, why don't just throw some garbage on him? Uh, he went and he brought a rope. And when Muhammad وسلم, went in the sujood and the ruku'ah, he put the rope around his neck and he pulled him from his sujood. And when Muhammad وسلم, was so much choking, he fainted. Then Abu Bakr al-Siddiq saw that what's happening from far, he came to save him. When he came to save him, he released the rope from his neck and the others laughing. And immediately they sent another man to beat up Abu Bakr because they almost killed Muhammad. Why would Abu Bakr and save uh, Muhammad وسلم, right? They attacked Abu Bakr and they beat his face. It says you could not identify his eyes from his nose or you couldn't look at Abu Bakr and know that is Abu Bakr and he went unconscious. So then the family of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to save him and here Hamza came. When Hamza saw his nephew almost dying and Abu Bakr Siddiq in that condition, he looked and he took his sword and he put all this, uh, whatever hunt, uh, hunted he has in his hand and he said, who's doing this to my nephew? Who's How dare you all of you? You wanna fight? Fight me as a man. Ana ana dini ibn akhi. I am following the religion of my nephew. He don't even know what is the religion. He don't, he just, if this is what caused this problem because my nephew following certain religion other than your religion as the idolatric worshippers, okay, I am on his path. 
you want to fight? Fight me. And he took the sword. He ran after the leader. They said, oh, stop, stop, stop. And everybody disappeared. Everybody's gone. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was taken to his house. Muhammad sallallahu was taken to his house. And Hamza went back home. And when he sat down in the house, he's thinking now, what did I say? Oh, I said, Ana ala dini Muhammad. I am on the dean of my nephew. Uh, I don't even know what's my nephew's dean. Now I can't, I can't take my world back because the Arab, when they say world, they cannot, they cannot go back with their world. I better go to Muhammad, visit him and find out what is this religion, right? <laughs> That's what I mind. In the morning, he comes straight to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa house and he tell him, Ya Muhammad. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was so happy that's his own uncle. And he said, uh, I said what I said. I was not aware, but I am teaching what is the religion and I am on your religion. And it says that Hamza and Muhammad وسلم, are almost the same age. And they uh, been nursed by one lady in Mecca. I remember people will nurse people, you know, babies didn't have formula. So they became the wet brother. That's his uncle and his brother. Uh, so he used to love them, Dima Hamza. So now Islam Hamza, Hamza come to Islam and Umar ibn al-Khattab just recently came to Islam, it's Islam is supported greatly. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, first of all, that's his immediate family. Secondly, he was very, very, very happy, very happy. Yani nothing can be happier. Yani everybody can be happy, but nothing can be happier than uh, Islam, Hamza. And now it's really, the religion is supported and they can go out, even though the prosecution did not stop till the age of uh, the fifth of the year. The fifth of the year, they start going after they torture Bilal. Remember, when they torture Bilal so much, we said Abi Bakr al-Siddiq, he will go and he buy him, right? He buy him off from Umayyah bin Khalaf. And Umayyah bin Khalaf, he said, wow, you want to pay me three, 30 dirham or dinar? Like, like what do you want to, you want to use a slave who doesn't obey you? But Ali Bakr al-Bilal, radiallahu anhu, been tortured a lot. In, in Mecca, I mean, uh, they will uh, tie him with chain and they will pull his body uh, around the, uh, Mecca by children. They will pay the children to do this. And uh, they will put stone on his body in the heat and they will put armor suit on his, on naked body for the heat to be 125 uh, Fahrenheit, right? And imagine you wear a suit made of steel, the one the warrior wore it and they will beat him. Ya la ilaha illallah Muhammad sallallahu That's when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq will buy him and uh, he will bring him to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and he will tell him, you're free to wajhillah. So imagine, imagine how many people came to Islam through Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Khabab, uh, when he accepted Islam, he was one of the worst people being punished. Yes, Sumaya, Sumaya got killed actually. When they, uh, Umayyah bin Khalaf, again, he is a master. It was her master. When he find out that this lady, 65 years old, accepted Islam, he will torture her, he will bring her out, beat her up, he tell her, just worship with this God. Just say something bad about Muhammad. And she will say, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad and Rasulullah, right? She will say that. Then uh, he was so upset of her, he put the spear on her stomach and he killed her immediately. So the first one who will die on the stage, even though she could say, she could name his idol, in her tongue to save her life, but her heart believe in God still and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but she didn't play that hypocrisy role. Uh, so um, they, killed in, they killed her in the front of her son Yasser, and then they killed the father because when they killed the wife, they went to the husband and they said, he's 70 years old. Uh, now you, you still want to follow the same religion? Look, nobody saved Sumayya. You still going to do the same? He said, yes, and they killed him. And uh, then they came to Yasser. We killed your parents now in front of you. And he was tied on the tree. What are we going to do with you now? We're going to torture you. We're going to kill you, just like with your parents. And he told he called on Hubal. He told them, no, 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 I'm not following Muhammad. I believe in Hubal. So they untied him. But then he, Yasser, it says in the seerah that he ran to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he felt so bad. He crying, grieving that, Ya Rasulullah, I told them Hubal. 
but I, my heart, wallah, is still in the state of Iman. I'm the one who introduced my parents to come to this religion and they get killed in front of me. I was so scared, I was so scared. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told him, uh, the ayat came, it says, uh, if your heart's still in the, you know, in the, in the Iman, uh, don't worry about what your tongue said. But those people saw the punishment, they, they felt the pain, physical pain. Khabab, they will make a fire with a stone. Stone, they will set up stones next to each other. They will set up a fire on the stone. And then they will set up the under the stone, they will put all the wood. And then when the stone become like a charcoal, red, they will take the shirt of Khabab and they will put him and will, they will pull the body of Khabab on the top of the stone like this back and forth. All his life, Khabab's body was marked with this fire. He goes, the only way the fire will stop when the shahma to batni, when the fat of my body will melt and drop on the, on the stone, it will cool me off. And in this condition, he didn't die, subhanAllah, somebody else will die. He will come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, make dua for us on surna. You're a prophet, you're a messenger. Make dua for us, we are weak. Make dua against those people. Let them be, you know, tortured and killed. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will tell them, just like he told uh, uh, Yasir, sabran ala Yasir. He promised the family of Yasir, فَإِنَّ مَوْعَدَكُمْ الْجَنَّةِ Physically, he promised them that you die in this condition, you go straight to Jannah. So the first shahida in Islam was a woman. The first person who accepted Islam also that was a woman, Khadija radiallahu anha. So women have a great job in Islam. It's not like we're separated. We are people, men and women. There's no gender in Islam. There's a nas. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he call us many times, a hadith many times call us by nas, all people. It's not all men or women, no. Our roles as, we can play as a role of da'wah just like the men do in it, subhanAllah. So uh, he will come to Khabab, when Khabab come like this, his fire, he's back on fire like this, uh, and he will tell him, Ya Khabab, people before you, they used to bring alive, will sow from their head to their bottom and split them into half without anesthesia, while they were alive. So people always suffered. Uh, uh, look, Ashab al-Ukhdud, that's why I came in, in you know, surah, we read it. قُتِلَ أَصْحَابِ الْأُخْدُودِ النَّارِ ذَاتِ الْوَقُودِ إِذْهَمْ عَلَيْهَا قُعُودِ The king ordered, he made the valley of fire, and whoever believed in لا إله إلا الله, there is only one God, the king is not, not our God, right? They throw them, men, women, children, throw them in this valley full of fire just to burn and die. I mean, those are the what what punishment we go through, what what pain we go through sometimes, you know, sometimes we're so coward comparing to the Sahaba, to these people before us even. Allahu Akbar. So that's how uh, we're going to talk next week about Al-Hijr Al-Ula, when uh, the prosecution level went so high uh, in the year of five, and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so worried about these people who didn't have much help, right? Uh, he wants to send them to Ethiopia, Al-Habasha, and there is a priest there, and that priest follow the religion of Jesus, uh, Isa alayhi salam, and they will be protected. So we will talk about that. That was the first migration in the name of Islam, in the name of Allah, to uh, around 82 men and women and children went, and they took the boat and they traveled all the way to uh, Abyssinia, inshallah ta'ala. So this Islam took a lot of pain for us to come to receive Islam uh, as if we're receiving Islam and a, a, a tray of gold, a tray of silver. It, it is. We have all the books we need. We have all the knowledgeable people we need. We have all the media in our house, in our hand. And when you look at our Muslim condition, look how bad. Look how bad our condition. Our Iman is so weak. Our Muslim leaders are, are so weak, are trusting in the non-believers, governments to you know the rest to, for the things going on and we couldn't even give victory to our people who's fighting in Gaza physically not one Muslim country bring their army and to fight side by side with people of Gaza what a condition we're in today as a Muslim comparing 
to how they struggled. The first generation, that's why the Quran full of ayat. The first people who came to Islam, like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, like Uthman bin Affan, like Abu Khabbab, like, like Bilal, like Sumayya, like those are the first one who's gonna be in the highest level in Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved them the most, al-Muhajirin later on, then al-Ansar. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us yaqeen in our iman. May, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our faith so strong to die holding on this iman, on this Islam. Amin ya rabbal alameen. If anything I made mistake, it's from me. Anything was right from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I read a seerah Allah. I have the book. I listen to so many CDs, so many YouTube, so many scholars, famous scholars. Just don't listen to anyone. It has to be famous and trust uh, scholars to understand this life of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu and the way he did the education. It's a full of actions, full of action daily, daily. We're gonna talk one more week, if it's not two more week about the prosecution. The 13 years of uh, life, the Muslimin in Mecca was not at all easy life. Yet no one, no one registered in the history accepted Islam and they left, no one. Even though they're gonna die, even though they know they're gonna be tortured. You're not gonna find a, a hypocrite, one hypocrite, who came to Islam just to play the game, just to play his Muslim because he wants a position or anything in Mecca. Why? Because in Mecca, if you become Muslim, they're going to torture you. They're going to kill you. They're going to prosecute you. They're going to kick you out from the city. Why would you say, I am a Muslim? It should be the opposite. You should be playing the hypocrisy with the disbelievers. <laughs> okay, I'm not a believer, but in reality, you're Muslim, right? But the hypocrisy, that's another problem, appeared in the city of Mecca because whatever. Insha'Allah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan. Forgive me if I took over time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us love this religion, make us love the Nabi, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, the tabi'een. Ameen ya rahmatullah. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaykum as-salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.